Hey, good afternoon, AM 950. Uh, your progressive voice here in Minnesota, Doug Padgett in, uh, from 4 to 5 on what I like to refer to as the high holiday of parenting. The day, at least for Minneapolis parents, the day when the kids go back to school, when the big uh, yellow bus of freedom for the parents rolls up out in front of the house. Uh, you know, a lot of us love our kids. And uh, we love our teachers. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the, in the later on in the show. I mean, couldn't be more grateful for these people. These are uh, they, these are uh, people that offer themselves at every level of of civic engagement. I call them the first responders uh, Monday through Friday to the needs of our uh, of our children. Uh, so thank you so much, all the teachers. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But uh, just you know, acknowledging the fact that it's the day when there's also just a little freedom that comes to parents who, uh, who send their kids off to school. And uh, I'm really glad to be talking with James Lamond, our, our friend from the Center for American Progress, because uh, I'll tell you, I think about those kids, James, walking into school, and um, like I think this is true in a lot of elementary schools. They still hang a picture of the president on the wall. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, it was I remember seeing Jerry Ford up there and then seeing I don't remember seeing Richard Nixon, but he must have been on the wall. Uh, but I do remember seeing Jerry Ford. And uh, uh, now I think about these kids seeing uh, a portrait of Donald Trump hanging on the wall. And I feel like we all have to do something about it so that uh, those kids that are in school these days say, hey, what did all you adults do when that Trump thing happened to us? And uh, so, James, I really appreciate talking with you because uh, you help you help me feel a little less crazy, a little more hopeful, and at the same time, a little more of a realist, which can be depressing in its own right, uh, with this <laughs> Donald Trump thing. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah. Uh, what? How are you thinking about all this trouble that uh, that we've seen in the in the, uh, the last week's news? You know, it's just hard to imagine that a week could be any worse than you know the one back in April or the one in earlier in July. And then you see the uh, legal trouble that Donald Trump is in. And I know you you have expertise in in policy matters and in Russia and all a whole lot of other things. But how are you thinking about what's happening right now uh, with these legal matters? As we roll here into the week just before Labor Day, when people are going to start engaging in, uh, you know, paying attention to the the fall midterm politics so much more. It's kind of just been an amazing week. I mean, you think about it within, you know, especially you think back to the one period uh, last Tuesday where within a matter of minutes, simultaneously, the president's uh, right hand man for 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 over a decade uh, 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 pleaded guilty to eight counts mm. of, of federal charges, including tax evasion, bank fraud, and campaign fi- finance violations, implicating the president himself in the plea deal, uh, saying that he acted at the direction and the coordination of the president. Um, then you have his campaign manager almost simultaneously being found guilty uh, to a series of charges, including uh, bank fraud and money laundering charges. And we know... He was one of the star witness in his trial was right. the deputy campaign manager right. on the campaign. Right. The other guy who was a criminal <laughs> then, who was working with the campaign. Have, yeah. Then you have then you have, you know, Trump's uh uh CFO for years now cooperating with investigators and you have uh this David Pecker uh who is now cooperating. Uh so so I, I mean I think well, 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 we I, it, it, this this past week has brought me some hope that we will that, that you know oftentimes um, when we're looking at this the, you know the, the, the collusion investigation the crimes that are the corruption and the crimes that, that that have that have allegedly taken place and, and the overall kind of concerns we have as a country we a lot of times we, we, we're nervous that that will just be swept under the rug and that it will be and nothing will be exposed but I think you know it, this is this is a hopeful week in terms of uh, that, that for for those who believe in transparency and and accountability. Well, that's why I like talking with you, James, uh, James, because this is where my worry comes in. I think all of that happened. And those are things that some of us have been hoping would happen for a long time. We were pretty sure that, uh, you know, I was pretty sure that Paul Manafort would be found guilty and committed crimes. Uh, I was pretty sure that Michael Cohen wasn't going to hold up. Uh, you know who would have hoped that the uh, that the, the the financial insider would you know that's that uh, that he would flip that's that's hope beyond hope that you'd get that, but then here we are now Monday after all those things happen, and everything just seems like it's it's just moving along like normal, and uh, the polls haven't moved the politicians haven't moved, and it seems like that thing that some of us are hoping for that will finally say that the system is working. I don't know. Then there's a day like this, and I think nothing has changed. 
how, how should we think about this and how should we hold this? You know, you can be our uh, you can be our political therapist for a few minutes with your expertise. <laughs> how, how should I mean, we be thinking on these things? It's very rarely that I'm, I'm the optimist in the conversation. Oh, please. Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> but, I, but I do think that, um, you know, like, I mean, first of all, the, you know, yeah, I, I totally take your point and, 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 and I agree. And it is, you know, the, it's amazing that any one of these events have happened under right. any previous right. president, and it'd be earth shattering. I mean, there'd be calls for resignation. There'd be, you know, everyone be would be up in arms about it, right? Uh, and and things are just, you know, that that's not the that's not the response and the reaction that 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 uh, Trump has gotten, because, in large part because we're, we've become numb to it. We've become, you know, it's it's this has become a regular part of our, our life. Uh, but that said. I do think that this is this is in many ways, at least I'm hoping, the beginning of a process, not the end. Um, and I, I do see that you know, there, so so Manafort's trial was only the first of two trials, yeah. and according to um, reports, that that uh, Mueller has uh, three times the amount of evidence that in the second trial. And this is the one that's much more about a. Uh, 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 collusion with Russia. Um, this is about. His, this will include his his uh, unregistered FAR activities of so representing foreign governments without registering with the Justice Department. It'll include uh, more campaign related activities. So I think that I think the this was in, in some ways the Manafort trial was just the warm up act for 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 his second trial. And the same thing with with um, you know uh, 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 Alan Wieselberg and 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 Pecker and and these, you know these guys are cooperating but we don't necessarily know towards what end that information has not come out yet okay okay so uh help me think about this i'm of two minds and i appreciate your advice mm-hmm. i know a lot of listeners are wondering about this too if they follow the ins and outs of the trump saga and that is if if it seemed that robert Mueller and team did not have uh something of value as it relates to russia and to some kind of obstruction of justice or some kind of collusion they would not keep going with this investigation uh, as they have. That if they're not finding anything after this period of time, they would have said, you know, we've looked, but we don't have anything to work with here of one mind. Of the other mind, I think, if they have something that is uh, incriminating to the president and to his team that would be on the level of collusion or on the level of obstructing of justice, how can they keep uh, moving along so silently and allowing the president to do the things the president is doing, knowing that uh, they're holding uh, in their hands the evidence that would cause the, uh, the the public and Congress to rise up and to want to limit the president's capacities in some way. Both of those seem untenable in light of the, the circumstances that we're in. Uh, is there a third option or a fourth or fifth option that uh, that smart people like you are thinking about that that makes sense out of those those two realities? I I, I do. I, I also I would also add that uh, just you know and and I think that one of the key takeaways about about Mueller is that he is a career Republican. People forget that he's he's he ha, he is a he is a non political person, but he has been you know he served in. Uh, uh, George H. W. Bush's administration was was um, you know miraculous or was 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 put on a, a short list uh, despite the fact that he was a Republican for for uh, Clinton appointment to U.S. Uh, attorney. So I mean he he has a history as a Republican. So okay. he has no interest mm-hmm. in destroying a Republican president, a Republican party. Like this is not this is not a political actor on, on a witch, you know, on this witch hunt that the president keeps saying. So he ha- he is you know he is conducting it in a in a a, a kind of. Uh, very by the book manner, so he would not be pursuing it if he would not be pursuing lines of investigation. That if there's nothing there, right? Um, but th- but but I think one third, one potential third option is, and this is this is one of the things that that, that you know keeps me up at night, is that he finds something, uh, flushes it out in a report, and and then buries it, or I mean, he, he doesn't bury it, but nothing happens to it. Yeah, right. right? So he, he right. hands it in, and there's there's no action. It's just another Monday there's, after the day he releases that report. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, I, you know, this is this is why this is the most important <laughs> election of our lifetime. It, it is the most important election of our lifetime. And, and if you can hold on to the next into the next segment, I want to ask your opinion. I know you're not a, a strategist for uh, political parties, but if you think that um, the Democrats pushing for the removal of Donald Trump is something that they should do. And that's what makes this the most important election. I, I have an opinion about that and I will spend my fall barnstorming the country in a, uh, 
a caravan of hope-filled resistance trying to get people to do that very thing. Uh, but but I'm I'm interested in your in your thoughts on it. Is there anything uh, new in this final minute or so that we have here in this segment, though? Is there anything that you know about the Russia side of all this that, with your expertise as someone at the uh, Center for American Progress, pays attention to that others of us who uh, kind of watch the the news uh, via television and headlines wouldn't be paying attention to? Is there have there been any new developments? So I think I think two related developments are uh, really what's what's on my mind and, and, and what I'm watching for, and they're they're interrelated. First is uh, we know that that Russia's continued tr- continually trying to influence the 2018 midterms. Right? They, they now uh, there's nothing to indicate. There's nothing to show that, they, that they've that they've uh, been able to change anything in the computer systems. But we do know that they're sim- similar to what they did in 2016, they're running a disinformation campaign, and that is what um, you know. Facebook has discovered these uh, instances, and uh, you know, Bill Nelson, uh, Claire McCaskill, their campaigns have have reportedly been hacked. Um, mm. So there are, there's activity, and the second is that some intelligence sources are saying that the Kremlin, uh, that that their, that their sources in within the Kremlin and with, within Moscow are uh, have, have gone dark, and so the question is, what is, what else are they doing? And that's something that uh, uh, the U.S. security, uh, the, the intelligence community is looking at right now. Oh, that's okay. There, that, there's the kind of fearful thing that you, now, now you're back to your back to your throne there, James. That's the kind of thing that scares somebody over the break. Uh, the idea that they're going to be that there's something more going on and we don't have eyes on it. Uh, uh, can, can you hang on and come back here after after the break? I'd love to. Okay, I'd love to. Too. Hey, AM 950, the Progressive Voice of Minnesota. I'm Doug Padgett in here with James Lamont from the Center for Progressive Prog- uh, Progress. Hang, hang on with us over the break. Here, Hey, all, welcome back. AM 950, Progressive Voice of Minnesota. I'd like to in talking with James Lamont from the Center for American Progress about uh, this um, big week in the news. Uh, and there have been so many uh, in the last 18 months that have felt like the most consequential weeks in the politics of um, the of the 21st century and maybe of the 20th and 19th century. I don't know. I guess I guess time will time will tell if it has that kind of level to it. Uh, it's also the high holiday for parents with their kids going back to school. So um, in our in our third and fourth segments, we're going to talk about that. Uh, if you if you have something great to say about teachers, something great to say about people who invest their lives in kids uh, from you know 7:30 in the morning until 3:30 in the afternoon, I'd love to hear from you this, uh, to give us a call. So be thinking about that if you want to if you want to talk about what great work our teachers do and how important it is that we have uh, a public education movement in the United States that we do. Uh, but James, uh, but back to uh, you know the, what those kids are going to be experiencing when they're uh, in school. I, I I was born in 1966, so I don't know. I was I was in first grade uh, during the during second grade during the Nixon years. And uh, I graduated from high school in 1984. So that's now as an old man, I look back and I think, you know, it wasn't that 12 years wasn't that far from when I was uh, a first grader and Richard Nixon was being impeached or the threat of his impeachment to Ronald Reagan in 1984 when I graduated from high school. And as over that course of 12 years, I had totally forgotten about all of that. Right. I, I my initial engagement into politics was I think Reagan's this really kind of fun guy and he's the president and things seem to be going well. Right. And I guess sort of got bamboozled into into Republican thought as a high school kid because I didn't know anything. And uh, I just think about how fast that all flipped and changed and the American psyche uh, sort of bounced back and uh, we kind of moved on. And just in in a short period of time and 12 years is not that long ago. Right. That's. For those of us that are now this age, we're thinking here in, in 2018, like that's back to 2006, uh, you know, uh, that that little period of time from when George Bush was in the middle of his second term uh, until now, that's all the time it had been. And we'd sort of forgotten all about it. At least I had uh, about the, those Nixon years. Do you think as bad as this Trump thing can be? uh are we just eight or 12 years of uh, clean cleansing breath uh, away from uh, being OK? Or do you think there's something more more harmful going on here with the Trump administration than, than we've ever seen before? I mean, I, I guess I guess the answer is I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think back to what uh, to put, you know, post Watergate and, and there was a conscious effort to heal as a nation, to mm. correct 
the 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 ills that allow that to take place, right? There, so there, I mean, there was the you know there was a a official act of of government forgiveness of 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 Richard Nixon. He resigned in an act of forgiveness to in the in sense of a pardon, and that was supposed to be a healing. Uh, uh, gesture on, on one side there was also the, the the church commission and where they where that where we uncovered and did the work to actually uh, uh dig up and 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 see what what policy changes need to be made and 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 how to how to uh how to apply proper oversight and how to uh move forward and to not to not abuse intelligence of law enforcement agencies and i think these sort of you know we have yet to see we, we have we have not come to term with any of the any of the problems wow, that, yeah that's really uh, insightful the, the Trump, yeah uh, Exactly. So, we, so these, these, we, I don't know what what will happen. I think we need to come to terms with this as a country, um, and and we haven't yet. Well, part of the reason I ask is I, I feel like, and that's really an insightful uh, thought. So thanks for that. I I feel like that's part of the reason why this midterm election is so important. Here in Minnesota, we have a number of races that uh, where we need to uh, dislodge Republicans from control and let them go on and live their fine lives as not being our representatives any longer. Um, because it, there's no sense that I have at all that the current configuration of Republicans uh, in the House or the Senate have any ability, appetite, or moral compass that would allow them to do the kinds of things that you were just suggesting were necessary between 1972 and 1984 to uh, kind of turn the corner in this country. Uh, it just seems like there, there's the, that that what's necessary uh, if they had that if they had what was necessary to make those that that healing happen, they would have been doing something about the Trump administration already. I mean, I think yeah, they've had the chance to do that. It's been you know a year and a half or more more than that already, and uh, despite great pressure to to conduct. Uh, uh, a serious investigation about the about Russia collusion. There's been, you know, the, the House Intelligence Committee uh, investigation was a joke. Um, you, you look at the, you know, the minority staff issued a report. It, it closed down saying there was saying there was no collusion. It closed <laughs> down right. saying that there was no uh, that they, they disagreed with the intelligence community's own assessment that the. That, that the Russians were trying to help Trump. And the minority said the Democratic staff issued a report basically saying, here's a, a series of of lines of inquiry we want to pursue, but we were blocked. And so, I mean, it, it's like it's one thing after another. Helsinki happens, and there's no, no response. follow-up. Well, and, and I, I, mean, I put they, this they, square... They're abdicating their responsibility. And maybe I you mean, think I, about I, it differently, and, but I put this on the, on the Democrats as well. I, I have watched and listened to many Democrats, especially part of the, the standard sets, that don't even want to bring up impeachment now because they think it'll fire up Trump's base. So they're really leery about that. But I've watched them do almost nothing other than harangue and fist and, and you know, uh, a hand wash over the frustration that they have about how tr- how Trump is acting. And it seems to me that even a uh, the the party that's in the minority could be doing something, right? Whether that be things of legal power of trying to shut down the government uh, the, in, in some important ways that would grab people's attention or doing a sit in over at the White House or senators and Congress people actually saying something like they don't even st- they don't even come out uh, and 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 attack full throatedly what seems to be this virus that is moving through uh, our, our our administration. Um, do, do you have that sense, or do you think they're actually responding in ways that are are solid and healthy? Because I'll tell you, I, I am losing confidence in the current elected Democrats as well that they're going to actually do anything about this. Yeah, I mean, I'm so so. Uh, I'm not a political strategist, but I, just looking at it from from a a kind of policy angle, yeah. right? And then there's there, there's the Democrats have no power right now, so so in, in that sense, it's it's kind of frustrating for them, I imagine. But at the same time, I I I, I don't know necessarily what the what the what the levers are. But here here's a here's I guess where I would kind of square that is that. I, I, this is not necessarily an issue of Democrat versus Republican. Like right. it, it, to me, this is an issue of of the Congress of the United States doing its job to to hold the to to, to uh, in, in terms of checks yeah. and balances against the executive branch. Right. This is this is basic one hundred and one. Yeah, totally, uh, uh, totally. Uh, issues, right? And, the, and it's, you know, we're we're remembering John McCain this week, yeah. and 
he's, he's, he's by no means a, a liberal Democrat. Um, he's a, a conservative Republican who uh, who stood up and and called for a lot of this uh, uh, oversight. Who's who's been one of the most vocal critics of the president. And so I don't I don't see this necessarily as a partisan issue. I think we need people in Congress willing to hold the the, the um, yeah administration accountable and to actually conduct investigations and oversight, but not but. Yeah, good point. I, I mean, I'll tell you, but both parties I, are our and, fault. and I, I don't want to say anything. You know, I, I want to honor John McCain's full life and all. He's a very fine man. But I will just say, I think he represents very clearly that position of I will say things, but I will not use what the what power I have to actually put the brakes on. There were things that he he could have done as a single senator in uh, a Republican senator that could have called for uh, the release of taxes, that could have helped to stall out um, uh, 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 judges that were being in approval. There's things a senator could do. All the senators can do. You don't, it's not just the, 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 the uh, party that's in power, and they're not doing it. And I'll tell you, I think that is causing the population to say, maybe this isn't such a big deal. And uh, well, James, thanks so much. I really appreciate uh, having you on. Always appreciate your thoughts. It's uh, it's insightful and um, uh, makes me feel less less crazy and much more informed. So so thanks so much for being uh, for, for being on the show. Really appreciate it. That's James Lamont. You can find him over at the Center for American Progress. And I hope that you do. Uh, Doug Padgett will be back here after the break. AM 950 Progressive Voice of Minnesota. AM 950, Progressive Voice of Minnesota. It's a little uh, Bruce Springsteen song called Cadillac Ranch right there. I remember that back from being in uh, late elementary school and uh, hearing that song and thinking, who makes music that sounds like that? I've been loving it ever since. Makes me think about uh, all those teachers doing that good work today. It's uh, at least in Minneapolis and I think in St. Paul. Back to school uh, already, which, look, is happening before uh, Labor Day and to you know some of us old schoolers. Uh, that just seems like it's a little early. Rushing the kids. Rushing the kids into school and, and, and the teachers it used to be after Labor Day that school would start. But it's been starting earlier so the kids can be in. But today I want to ask if you would give, give me a call and uh, thank a teacher, uh, maybe somebody that's teaching right now. Uh, maybe you want to go generic in your teacher comments and appreciation. I, I live stream this on Facebook, and uh, a lot of my teacher friends listen and, and watch, and I want to I want to push it to them. So I want to I want you to give a chance to say uh, congratulations and thank you to them. You know they're busy working today, but they'll listen to the podcast and watch it on on, on the live stream. And I would love for you to uh, to tell them you appreciate. It. And the phone number here is nine five two nine four six six two zero five. And as radio hosts do, you say that twice nine five two nine four six six two zero five. Uh, and let me know about a teacher that's been important to you, uh, someone who's who's done uh, incredible work. Uh, maybe it was in your childhood. Maybe it's someone you're you're partnered with in life now. Maybe it's someone you know. Uh, maybe your own kids are in school, and uh, and you want to appreciate them and, and be thankful for them because it's incredible work uh, what what teachers do. I just couldn't be more uh, heartened and thankful. Now you know I, I I tease teachers sometimes. You know it's a tough job when you only have to work. Uh, you know. Uh, nine of the months of the year. Uh, but any of us who know the actual work that teachers do know that uh, not only are they working more than those nine months, uh, very often, and this is a bit of the shameful story of our uh, how we fund education, teachers are having to dig into their own pockets uh, to cover uh, for the, 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 the work that they have to do in their schools. Uh, there's a whole number of teachers right now, in fact, that uh, you can find uh, GoFundMe and other online fundraising efforts that want you to know that they're having to buy supplies for their kids. Uh, sometimes for the kids to use, actually, just having it because their parents might not have what it takes uh, to, ha- to outfit the kid for going to school, but also what the teachers need because the budgets get cut. And it's, um, it's this weird thing that we do where we uh, base it on property taxes in some ways, and then some schools get more, and the, the teachers do boosters in some places where parents are more uh, uh, able to be involved. Um, those schools do okay, and then the schools where the kids struggle, it doesn't go so well. well. And uh, so whether it's from elementary school kids, preschool teachers, uh, all the way up through high school and and even all the way into college, uh, that matters. And and David's got a comment about that. David from St. Paul, you're thinking about a college professor here in the in the in the fall, fall, early fall days of the school year. Yeah, I, thanks for taking my call. I just want to say that, you know, I, I was a lost soul in my early days. And so I 
I had a college professor, so I'm going to give a who changed my life. So I'm going to give a shout out to a, to the college professors as well. As I'm not undermining any of the high school, of but not, yeah. sometimes it takes for us lost souls. It takes a little longer to uh, appreciate what they did. So hey, that's great, hey, David. If, doing David, if you, if you don't mind me asking, um, how, how was it for you getting through like other parts of school, elementary school, high school? Did you uh, did you feel like a lost soul then, or did that feel like it set in when you were in college? No, I just. C's, C's got degrees, you know, <laughs> and when I got to college, that didn't work for me. So, you know, yeah. so I, I realized that, uh, yeah, just doing well in school is just as fun as going out and having fun and doing other things. So, yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. We used to say C, C stands for credit. I like the way you say that C yeah. stands for degrees. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Really, really appreciate that call. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we know happens. You know, these school teachers are, um, they're up early. They're thinking about kids all day long. Uh, I have a friend, uh, she teaches in the Minneapolis school, school district and she's starting today. And she told me last night, she currently has 29 kids on her, on her class roster, 29 kids, second and third graders. Uh, she teaches in a bilingual school, kids in second and third grade, 29 of them speaking two different languages. That's incredible work. That is, um, that takes a kind of commitment and a, and, a, and a level of caring and people all around are trying to, you know, uh, create more support. And a lot of a lot of people's families are in transition. So they don't know where they're going to be and what school district they're going to be in if families are moving. So some of those kids might come and go. And that's a lot of disruption. And it takes a consistent voice. It takes uh, someone who's willing to stick it out. And, and that can have a lot of impact on, on, a, on a teacher's family. I'm sure you can all imagine this, how, how much effort and work it is to be a teacher and uh, you're thinking about kids all day long. And then you come home and if you have your own children at home, all of a sudden, you you feel like you're right back in it. Like there's there, there's no break uh, for that. And in, in fact, uh, Mark, you've got a comment about, about being uh, the child of a teacher, huh? Hi, Doug. Hey, Mark. Yeah, actually, his name came up yesterday or Saturday at my son's wedding. Yeah. And he had a tri- oh. The baptisms, I assume they went swimming. Oh, right? swimming. Yeah, great pun. Thank you. They did. And I hope I hope the wedding was good. Some of us have been tracking your, uh, wedding, your son's wedding. That's I, I apologize to everybody else, but Nick and Beth just set the bar for, you know, for weddings. It was phenomenal. <laughs> but Mr. Colburn came up, Wayne Colburn, the gentle giant. He was a third grade teacher, basketball coach at Prince of Peace Lutheran School that was mm. um, in Pridley. It's a church now. The school is no longer in existence, but he had the kids from first through eighth grade. And six foot six, you know, in his day, a hyper athlete. And you would think that a third grade kid would be intimidated by a guy who's six foot six, but the influence that he had on their mm-hmm. lives, and these people don't teach for the money. Right. right. Um, and. I mean, if, was, if, if they're teaching for the money, they need to set their sights no a little higher. Right. Us, but his spirit was with us, you know, over nice. the weekend by the people in the wedding party that knew him. Wow. And his name came up. So, uh, you know, this is just another shout out to Mr. C. You know, great job and, uh, you know, big shoes to fill and carry on, man. Yeah, Mark, thanks so much. I appreciate it. And again, congratulations. Hey, that, that, that's that's Mark and David uh, calling us here at 952-946-6205 uh, and expressing their appreciation for, for school teachers. Um, they're, uh, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that uh, I fly fairly often for the work that I do. And when I'm at the uh, airport, very often, and some airlines have a special thing that they do for people that are active military. And it's it's a nice gesture for people that are in the active military. And they allow them to get on earlier. Some airlines give them a great uh, a little break on the uh, luggage fees. There's just some things that they do for people that are, are doing public service, right? People that are, are putting their lives on the line and take nothing away from people who are in the military. But I'll tell you, not every person in the military is literally putting their life on the line every single day. School teachers 
are putting their lives every day by inv- not on the line, but putting them into the line that leads into the lives of these kids. And I would love it if, if every business, if you run a business, if you operate a business, if you, if you frequent a business, say to the business owner, hey, how about at least for the early months of the fall, uh, September, October, we do something special for school teachers. We, 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 we offer them a, a free upgrade on their coffee. We, we throw in a piece of pie at the diner. We, uh, we, um, uh, you pick up the, you pick up the tab for a school teacher, uh, by prepaying someplace, uh, you know, at a, at a, at a, at a restaurant, uh, you find some way you, you, you give some, some benefit, but just so as a society, we say, we think it's really important and important, not only to the care of our children, it's not just child care that's happening. It's our investment in our civic life. Back in the early 2000s, when the United States made a commitment to public education, and Minnesota was a, was a big leader in this, a commitment to public education meant that kids were going to be educated fully and equally through grade 12. They didn't have to make a decision to leave uh, school or make a decision to pick what they were going to study. They would all be educated in a general educational model that would allow them the freedom to choose in college what they wanted to do for their lives. You might not know, but kids around the, around the world and in the United States previous to that, they were having to make decisions when they were 12 and 13 years old about what career they wanted to be in. Do you want to work in the factory? Did you want to be an accountant? Did you want to go into some of the other fields? Who wants to make that decision when you're 12 and 13 years old? Well, we made a decision in this country called the high school movement that we would fund public education all the way through high school incredible commitment. We need to keep up that commitment and double down on that commitment. And when you're voting this fall, when you're at talking to your state legislator, when you're talking to the people for your school board, when you're talking to your city mayor, when you're thinking about your congressional votes, when you're thinking about these votes, when you're voting for, for a senator and you ever have a chance to interact with them, I'd encourage you to ask them what they think about funding. Now, there's going to be a lot of disagreements about how we fund education in this state, where it comes from. But I'll tell you this. You talk to teachers There's not enough money equally distributed across the system. And if any politician tells you that there is, if they give you that old standard Republican line, there's enough money we just need to move to greater efficiencies. You have any one of those those politicians or any one of those lobby tax limiting lobbying groups spend a week in an elementary school with my friend who's got 29 second and third graders in her class. And you tell me if she's not making good on every one of the efficiency demands for how you educate 19, 22, 25 or 29 kids for six and a half hours a day when kids are trying to learn in second and third grade. Anybody tells you what we really need are better teachers who can use, who can be more efficient so that they can spend less money. That short sighted attitude about our teachers and about our school systems is unbelievable. And I'll add one more point on this. Some of the ballooning of education costs, especially in the K through 12 areas, has to do with special education. Back in the early 1990s and late, late 1980s, our country made a commitment to educating special education, kids who needed extra help and support. There was a federal mandate on schools to treat kids who need special help and support. And we've had those, I've had I have those kids in my family. I know a lot of them. It's incredible work that special education teachers do. And it's a one-on-one, one-on-three, one-on-five student-to-teacher ratio. It matters. It's important. It's crucial. And that's part of what's made the budgets balloon is that you can't run the same formula on kids who need an extra level of help. So the federal government puts a mandate that you have to fund it, but they don't put any funding with it, so then it has to come from the school budgets. Well, it's the right thing to do to educate kids, every child, fully and completely, regardless of their need. This is the kind of thing that, as a society, we should be paying for fully and completely. My advice is that our budget should say, how much money do you need to do this right? And you make the budget for education $1 more than that. So you always come in under budget, but you ask the question, how much do you need to do it right? If we would take the same approach to this kind of work that businesses take to other, to other approaches where they say, what's it going to take? And we're going to figure it out. And we're going to, we're going to allocate the money necessary to make it happen. Or, you know, who else does that? The military. 
So if we take the same approach to our kids and to our education we take to the military, how much do you need? And the answer is, you've got it. We would see something really powerful happening. So if you want to give us a call here, 952-946-6205 after the break, I'd love to hear your story about this. Doug Padgett on uh, Back to School Day. So, That's the why they never grow. They just blow around from the Hey, welcome back, AM 950. It's uh, 4.50 in the afternoon. A uh, whole lot of school teachers, especially in uh, you know the school districts that have started already, are uh, breathing that sigh of relief and heading home after uh, day one of the students being there. And those schools that still start here after Labor Day, uh, teachers are thinking about it uh, very, uh, very directly today. That uh, you know, a week from tomorrow, they're going to be back in the classroom as well. It's it's incredible work, and I think we should congratulate them, thank them, and, and engage with them. Hey, and, and Eric, uh, you've got some thoughts about this. Yeah. Um, well, I was just thinking, I didn't really. I mean, I knew teachers were important, but it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I really learned how much I respect them and mm. you know what they go through, because I've been working as a tutor as one of my other jobs, and. I know that just trying to make one or even two children uh, stay focused <laughs> on a topic for like an hour is borderline impossible. So the fact that they're doing it with uh, 25 students for eight hours a day, it blows my mind. I don't even it seems superhuman. Yeah, it's got yeah, it's it's, kinda, it's, it's really it's, something else, isn't it? And for people who don't know, you're, you're a math tutor uh, specifically. And um, and that's a uh, you, you're able to stay focused on one idea and one topic. And and that's I, I think any oh, frankly, anybody that can tutor someone in math, I think, is also one of part, part of the wizardry uh, and is really incredible. Uh, but, yeah, I think you're right that these these teachers who uh, can do all kinds of things. Uh, for these kids, it's really um, it's 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 really remarkable. Well, what was your teacher experience like, Eric? What, what when you went to school? Were you? Uh, no, were... I was kind of like uh, David, I guess. Uh, I was kind of you know I I did all right. I was mm-hmm. kind of a bright kid. I could make it by without trying too hard. Yeah. So I didn't really pay attention to a lot of you know the teachers and really uh, I guess respective as enough as I should. Yeah, yeah, I was I was sort of that way too. Like I just kind of had no idea. They were they were they were just adults in my life that I had no yeah. concept for how to. Yeah, for how how to think about them. I never, and I was a kid, and I didn't think about as uh, adults as people. I know that sounds yeah. sort of weird. Like I didn't dehumanize them or anything, but I thought about them as adults, you know. And and I was yeah, they do it because they're supposed one. to. Yeah, right, right. And they, I don't know, they like had all the power and, and, and I wasn't a, a, uh, a good student. Uh, school was not uh, the structure that, that sort of worked well for me. Uh, and, and I think about kids like me and maybe like you and, and David or others, um, that here are these teachers, right, who have committed themselves to teaching and they got some, you know, frankly, some knucklehead like me in that classroom that uh, has no interest in that whatsoever, right? Uh, I'm just sort of getting along and kind of getting by, and they have to figure out how to deal with uh, someone who doesn't really think about being uh, in school or doesn't, you know, have a whole lot of, like, family history and family support. I always knew those kids at school who their parents were really uh into school and they thought a lot about school and like they were around and activities and i don't know my parents just had other stuff going on we, we weren't a school family that wasn't the place where we found our connection and all uh so here we were uh, here i was just you know kind of making the best that i could and yet all of those teachers made sure that you know a kid like me and maybe a so, you know, someone like you and, and others were just as included and we were just as important in all of this. And, and I wasn't, I wasn't helping at all. You know, I was, uh, yeah. I was just, I was kind of dead weight when, when it comes to that. And, and I think, I think now, and I have for years as an adult, uh, just how hard that must have been for them because they wanted to make sure that we were, you know, we were still going to make it at least, you know, get to the next grade, be, be grade level, Appropriate. I, I remember getting report cards, uh, you know, if they go under for that teacher conference, the report cards would say, you know, uh, he's generally bright or whatever they would write to sort of be nice. And then they would say, uh, really needs to apply himself and take school more seriously. Like, like that didn't happen yeah. one year. That was pretty much uh, the consistent story all the way through. Right. And when I was a kid and even in college, I remember thinking about that from the kid side. 
But I'll mm-hmm. tell you, thinking about that now from the adult side, like just what a total pain in the ass that must have been for teachers oh, to yeah. be like, oh, you know, Mr. Deadweight over here, Mr. Gabby, and won't, you know, won't be quiet and won't pay attention. But, uh, you know, the thing about public school is it's one of our uh, shared public spaces. And people like me and you, we're, we're welcome in those places, yeah. fully and completely, 100% in. And the brunt of that, the, the 99% of the brunt of me being the way I was as a, as a kid in school fell on the teacher. Like they, they were the ones that had to deal with that. It was, it was, you know, there was nobody, there was nobody helping that teacher to figure out what to do with the, uh, with the kid that won't, won't, won't engage and uh, quote needs to apply himself and take school a little more seriously. And so I'm, I'm so grateful for uh, teachers that were, were, were willing to hang in there uh, you know, with me and, and, uh, you know, I fi- finally got my, my, my second wind about five or 10 years out of graduate school, you know, where I kind of think about myself as a, as a, uh, as a student, I guess. Yes. Hey, Patrick from Apple Valley, you've got some thoughts about the portrait of the president hanging in the uh, schools, huh? Yes. I, uh, was not a supporter of president Obama and, um, uh, I don't ever remember hearing the conservatives saying anything about, oh, the poor school children who are going to be attending school and having a portrait of, of President Obama, it was a non-issue. And, and now suddenly, I know the left is all hyperventilating about Trump being elected, and now this comes up, and I just think it's it's kind of uh, another example of the mass hysteria. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. I, I don't think I heard people saying that about about Obama either. I think even people who disagreed with Obama's positions I don't think they said it. I don't think they said it about George Bush either. I, I, I'm pretty sure. I think that's the difference, uh, as, as I would see it, Patrick, and you're welcome to see it differently. But that is what, the way Donald Trump acts as a person seems that it is out of flow with the kinds of qualities that you would want. In other words, you could disagree with this, with the positions of Barack Obama. And I, I did, and you you did on other topics, perhaps, than, than, than what I disagree with him on. But there was no sense that if you, that having his portrait hanging and saying this is a person who plays a role in our culture and society, and it, you're, it's it's he acts in a way that we want to honor the position and the person in the position. What has happened with Donald Trump because of him, of him insulting other citizens, both verbally and in written form? with his aggressive stance, with his rudeness and uh, lack of civility, that's the thing that I'm raising, not his policies only. Like kids are going to have to go to school and see presidents that disagree with them politically. I get it. In fact, most kids don't develop a political uh, sensitivity when they're in school. But you could look at even whether it was Jerry Ford that I looked at or Jimmy Carter that I looked at or uh, or, or Reagan uh, or um, I was out of uh, school by the time Bush was there. But any of those people, you would have said, hey, that's a fine man. The way John McCain spoke about about Obama. I don't know, Patrick. Maybe you disagree. Say it differently. That's the thing I feel about about uh, Trump. So you, you'll get the last minute. Tell me what you're thinking. Well, I will say that Trump, Donald Trump was not my first choice. He was my 18th choice. But when <laughs> he was nominated for the Republican yeah. at the convention, I, I support him. I voted for him. Am I proud of how he acts? Am I proud of, of the way he behaves? No, I cringe. However... You've got to understand that the man is a fighter, and he takes it he takes it down and dirty. And the Republicans uh, have lacked that fighting instinct. So, so there's I get a that. certain trait I get that, to he... his his method and, and his tenacity that I admire. I but I don't always agree. Yeah, thank you, but, Patrick. But we're we're just going to run out of time. I'm not cutting you off, but we're just going to run out of time. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate it. I'll just say there's fighters and there's dirty fighters. And uh, being a fighter doesn't mean you act dirty. AM 950, Progressive Voice of Minnesota. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow.